Now, thank you for the topic. Originally, this was going to be uh, a pro-con debate. Uh, I like to think that my compatriot chickened out, but I think that's actually not true. Because I have the easy job. I have to convince you that we are ready to perform next generation sequencing in all MDS patients. So these are my disclosures. Go back. So let's start with this pretest question. Which genetic features are required by the new ICC or WHO classification criteria for actu accurately diagnosing a patient suspected of having MDS? Is it a mutation of SF3B1? Deletion of chromosome 5Q, complex karyotype, mutation of B53, or all of the above? Excellent. You guys don't need the, the class at all. Mm. All right. All right, I guess we have another question. Which pattern of genetic abnormalities is associated with a more favorable prognosis by the IPSSM? See if you're paying attention to the last talk. And you can see the answers here. That's a good one. All right. Hmm. So what I'll be telling you about today is that we have a pretty good understanding of the, ge of the genetic landscape for MDS, that we have been using this information to help care for patients, and now we have new tools that are going to help us do this even better, and that includes new classification schemes, new risk stratification tools that you just heard about, and in the near future, probably more specific molecularly targeted therapies. And finally, I'll end by talking about some future roles that we might use NGS for that we're currently not using today, but I think have a lot of promise. So let's start with that landscape of MDS mutations. We've known for many years now that there are multiple genes that are recurrently mutated in MDS. Now, no single gene is the most common or is found in, in the majority of patients, I should say, but there are a large number of genes that are mutated recurrently that can be found at greater than 1 or 2% that have really important prognostic significance and perhaps some significance for choosing select therapies. And this is really borne out by the IPSSM data that were published recently, where 48 genes were present in at least 1% of patients. 94% of patients had a somatic mutation or other oncogenic lesion that could be identified. And most patients had multiple of these mutations. So there was plenty of opportunity to use this information not only to ensure that we have a clonal disorder, but to help take that information and then use it to understand the disease better. So this isn't new. The NCCN guidelines have been recommending that we use genetic testing for MDS for quite some time, even though they aren't necessarily explicit about what you do with all the information. And in fact, we have been using this for many years. So how has it been used historically? We can start with classification. Even in 2016, the WHO had a couple of categories of MDS that were characterized by genetic abnormalities. The longstanding MDS with isolated L5Q being one, but they for the first time in, in, in introduced a category where you had a somatic mutation in a single gene, in this case SF3B1, that could identify patients who have MDS with ring sideroblast. Now this is going to be the minority of patients, since this required that patients have between 5 and 15 percent ring sideroblast, but as you'll see, we're really turning this idea on its head and going with the, the molecular annotation instead. And as uh, Dr. Griffith showed you, we could take mutations, even in this paper that is uh, alarmingly 10 years old now, and identify that patients did a lot worse than our prognostic scoring systems might predict when they had certain adverse mutations, and that was true even in patients with lower risk disease. When we had the IPSSR, that didn't change. There were a large number of mutations that had independent prognostic significance, and they're shown to the right of that vertical dotted line, and one gene that had favorable prognostic significance that was independent of the IPSSR, and it made a very significant difference on outcome. In red is the survival of those individuals that had one of these adverse genes, and you can see that it's about a third to a half of that of patients who lack this mutations. And then for patients who have SF3B1 mutations, their survival is perhaps a little bit better. But there's a lot of nuance to this, and now that we have tools that incorporate this data in a more eloquent way, we can begin to tease these apart. So what about using NGS as a diagnostic tool? 
We have two new competing, I should say, classification schemes that came out this year, one from the International Consensus Classification published in Blood, and the other the fifth edition of the WHO classification scheme published in Leukemia. And while they have a lot of overlap, there are some differences between them, but both move to a more molecular definition of disease for MDS and other myeloid disorders. Another way to look at this, courtesy of Dr. Surgeon, who lent me the slide, is that we had been considering MDS in really three silos, those that have low BLAS, BLAS that are 5 to 9 percent, and BLAS that are 10 to 19 percent. And within the low BLAS category, we're considering those individuals that have <coughs> differences based on morphology, single lineage dysplasia, multi-lineage dysplasia, ring sideroblasts, and of course, the MDS del 5Q category. So what's changed with the new classification schemes? We still have these three silos that we consider for BLAS count. But if you focus on those patients with lower than 5% BLAS, you see that now we have new categories in here. There's MDS hypoplastic by the WHO, but importantly, now there's this MDS with SF3B1 mutation. And MDSRS is really something very different than what it used to be, as I'll show you in a moment. We still have MDS del 5Q. There's a new category for patients with high BLAS that focuses on fibrosis. And we have that new category of MDS with biallelic TP53 mutation, and that's regardless of BLAS count. It doesn't matter if it's less than 5% or 10% or more. So let's take a look at that MDS with SF3B1 mutation category. These are individuals that obviously have an SF3B1 mutation. It doesn't matter whether they have ring sideroblasts or not, but of course many of these patients do. And at least for the ICC, these mutations have to be present at a varying allele frequency of greater than 10%. So you need to be sensitive enough to pick these up, but also accurate enough to identify where this is a minor clone or a major clone. And importantly, these individuals who fit this category can't have other adverse mutations or abnormalities, like they cannot have DEL5Q, they, can they cannot have monosomy 7, and a few others. And importantly, at least by the ICC, they also can't have mutations in RUNX1. And as Dr. Griffith just showed you, the IPSSM actually teases this apart even, even more, as shown here. They actually categorize three different types of SF3B1 mutant patients, those that have SF3B1 really as an isolated mutation with maybe perhaps other more benign mutations at most. That's the bottom category here called SF3B1 alpha. Those are the individuals that have that favorable prognosis I alluded to. But if you have SF3B1 and a DEL5Q mutation, even though these are both independent favorable findings, when you put them together, those patients actually have a worse outcome. For SF3B1 beta, the SF3B1 mutation that co-occurs with several adverse mutations, including those in B-Core, RUNX1, NRAS, STAG2, and, STAG and SRSF2, and these patients also have a poor outcome. So you can see that you can't just single one gene to identify patients who fit into this category. You really need to look at a broader panel of genes in order to understand how they are better subdivided and how the prognosis is going to be uh, teased apart. So what about that category with TP53 mutations that, that were talked about? These are individuals who have both alleles of TP53 that are negatively impacted, and these patients tend to have a complex karyotype, and they can lose the other allele in a wide variety of ways. They could lose it by loss of heterozygosity, by mutation, by deletion of the entire gene locus. And it's important to tease that apart because the differences in survival are quite different in those individuals that have one allele lost versus two, and it really impacts how we think about what the next appropriate step in therapy is going to be. In fact, we may actually need to improve our NGS techniques to be able to do this more accurately, as right now there are certain scenarios where varying allele frequency alone really isn't enough to tease that apart. So this slide from Dr. Bernard's uh, paper in Nature Medicine shows uh, down here at the bottom that if you have one mutation, you tend to have a lower VAF, but you can see that you might have more than one mutation or loss of heterozygosity and still have a slow VAF clone that has both alleles affected, and those patients still have a very poor prognosis. So hopefully not only will NGS help us identify these patients, but identify them better than we're doing today. So what about the borders of MDS? We have CCUS, which is separated from MDS by dysplasia. These are the more clonal cytopenias, and as we increase the blast count, we have a divisor between MDS and AML. However, this has now become a little bit more fuzzy. We now have a divisor, at least by the ICC, where MDS and AML as an overlap syndrome really began at 10% blast. So this is one area where we're starting to, I think, take patients out of the isolated MDS category and put them into a different context. But we're also doing this genetically. We're going in and identifying patients that maybe don't have 20% blast, but have certain abnormalities that might be AML defining. And this includes rearrangements in a variety of different genes, but also mutations in genes like NPM1. 
And it's important to identify these even though they're relatively rare in pure MDS because these patients have a different prognostic outcome and perhaps better response to particular types of therapy. There's also a category of AML with myelodysplasia related changes that is now AML that's myelodysplasia related. And it's defined in part by certain chromosomal abnormalities, but also by a wide variety of mutational changes that are typical of MDS and found a little bit rare in de novo AML. So again, not a single gene is going to get you all this information. You really need to do broad panel sequencing to get it to more accurately identify how you should classify your patient. But the big elephant in the room has always been this concept of CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis. This is much more common than MDS and confounds how we interpret these mutations, particularly in a diagnostic setting. Are the cytopenias that I'm seeing a consequence of these mutations that I found, or is this just an incidental finding that's really common in the background and it isn't really related to the cytopenias that I'm trying to identify the cause of? Now, the difference here is important, and both the WHO and the ICC have defined CHIP and CCUS very similarly. And they identify that there has to be a somatic mutation in a myeloid malignancy gene with an allele frequency of at least 2%. So a very sensitive test would be required to identify some of these. There can't be evidence of a hematologic disorder that's otherwise uh, defined. And for CHIP, there has to be an absence of blood cell count abnormalities that are attributable to these mutations, whereas for CCUS, of course, there has to be an unexplained cytopenia that may be attributable to these mutations. And Really, it is this broad panel sequencing that's going to help us tease these apart. We've seen evidence already from uh, Luca Malcavati's group and others that the presence of these mutations in the setting of an unexplained cytopenia is not a benign finding, like it might be in CHIP, that about a, a 35% or 40% of these individuals with unexplained cytopenias will have a, an abnormality, and the greater number of abnormalities or abnormalities in certain genes like splicing factors or RUNX1 or JAK2 pretend a really rapid rate of progression to frank myeloid malignancy. And you, whereas if a person has a more chip-like mutation in DMT3A, TET2, or ASXL1 with low VAF, then perhaps these patients have a lower rate of progression. But importantly, an absence of mutations is really highly predictive of not progressing to a myeloid malignancy. So again, broad panel sequencing would be required here to really capture this nuance, although as few as 10 genes might do a reasonable job. We also know more about what certain clones with certain mutations are likely to do. So there's emerging data about the rate of progression or expansion of these clones in individuals with CHIP or CCUS. And you can see that, not surprisingly, the splicing factor mutations that are more typical of MDS, more typical of AML, tend to grow more quickly. JAK2 mutations tend to grow more quickly. And DNMT3A mutations are remarkably slow to expand. Interestingly, TP53 mutations are also relatively slow to expand, and again, it would be important to try to understand how many alleles are affected in these scenarios. We are now developing tools, like this one shown on the right by Bolt Nadal, that looks at patients who have had breast cancer and have subsequently developed clonal hematopoiesis to see what their risk of progressing to a therapy-related myelodeoplasm might be. It takes into account a wide variety of gene mutations, the varying allele frequency, the number of mutations that are present, and of course, some hematologic parameters as well to help predict this rate of progression. So again, panel sequencing could help us get this information, even if we already had a clear diagnosis, understanding that a patient may not have MDS, but may be at risk for it. So what about using NGS to select therapy? Mutational selection of therapy is becoming much more common in oncology in general. Can we do this in MDS? Well, we can borrow from experiences in AML. So we know that IDH can be mutated in this disease. It can give rise to an oncometabolite that affects certain enzymes that are important for the proliferation of hematopoietic stem cells and, unfortunately, disease cells. Now, IDH is mutated in a minority of MDS cases, maybe 7 to 10 percent, but we have two, I guess now three drugs that have been approved for use in AML that target IDH1 and IDH2, and we have several studies now that have looked at this activity in patients with MDS. So here's an example from a recent paper published by Courtney DiNardo now that looked at patients with IDH2 mutations and MDS. And the top here in blue are shown those that have never been treated, that were treated with a combination of azocytidine and inocytidine. And in the bottom in yellow here are patients who had been refractory or relapsed after HMA that were treated with inocytidine as a single agent. And you can see really meaningful response rate in these individuals that presumably wouldn't be there had you treated patients without the IDH mutations. So we're starting to get to the point where therapies are a, a, a available and perhaps will soon be approved in MDS 
that are going to be guided by the selection of certain molecular abnormalities. So what about future directions of MDS? Before I get there, I want to add something that actually uh, Dr. Griffiths has reminded me of, which is that when you do panel sequencing, it's also an opportunity to identify germline mutations that, again, could influence how you care for patients, DDX41 being a great example of something you may not necessarily suspect based on any sort of syndromic features, and even based on family history, since it's not universally penetrant. So you have the opportunity with genetic sequencing at the outset to look for these potential congenital conditions that might impact who you select as a donor or who you search for uh, as a donor within a family and so on. But what else can we use NGS for going forward? Well, one of the things we can do is look at the likelihood of relapse. So instead of testing just a diagnosis, we can test after a certain therapy has been given. So I think this really interesting paper published in 2018 looked at the presence of mutations after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation using very sensitive sequencing techniques down to 0.5% via variant allele frequency. And the presence of these abnormalities was associated with a very high rate of relapse. And that was independent of whether a patient got myeloblative conditioning or reduced intensity conditioning. And if mutations were present at day 30, it was not a good sign for them. Now, mutation clearance isn't required for patients to improve with therapy, for example, after hypomethylene agent therapy, but there is a trend to see the VAFs reduce, so the variable frequency may go down. This seems to be particularly true for patients who have TP53 mutations, that if the variant allele frequency can fall to less than 5% with treatment, then perhaps these patients do better. And maybe it's these individuals that are the ones that we should be considering for subsequent consolidation therapy with something like transplant, as they may have a longer time to relapse and may have more opportunity for that graft to help them out. So to summarize, we really do understand the range of mutations in the vast majority of our MDS patients, more than 90% of which will have a mutation. We know how to apply this information clinically as they help define MDS subtypes and help us distinguish MDS from related disorders. They're integrated into our prognostic scoring systems now, and they may identify patients who can benefit from particular therapies. So broad panel NGS is our best tool to gather this data today, and it'll be used in more innovative ways in the future. So with that, I'll end and pass it off to Dr. Santini after we answer this question. Can we do the poll? Probably going to do the next one next. Nope, this is going to be Dr. Sanchez. Pass it off to you. After yeah. the, maybe we leave the question after the second part. Okay, okay. For the answers on the panel because with the, the physical people don't have anything that I know of how to answer these questions. You. What was the question? You Basically, should have, you should have uh, got seen the, the QR code. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. The, this is uh, the way to go. Okay. Rafa, you can stay here. Thank you. Okay. So this was the QR code, sorry. 